respected speakers on the dais and my dear brothers assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you so today my topic is on answering some questions raised by pravin togadiam i will not be able to answer all the questions some questions which are relevant to our times now well when we advertise this program some of them were having this notion in their minds why do we have to answer pravin togadia why don't we just leave it there let him speak whatever he wants we have to just keep hearing to it we know what the truth is so why do we have to answer him so that's some of them they have in their minds why do we have to get into this well allah subhanahu wa taala says waqulu qawlan sadida speak that which is truthful speak that which is right if you do that then yuslih lakum a'malakum allah says if you do that he would rectify your deeds wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum and he would forgive your sins wallahu ghafurur rahim and allah is the most forgiving and he is the most merciful so we have to speak about this to stop a lot of communal hatred amongst people we must not underestimate the speech of a person hitler was a person who spoke but his speech it led to the world war mussolini and all these people they were good speakers but their speech led to the loss of so many lives so if you want to curb this then we need to speak against falsehood you must take it as a responsibility it's a moral responsibility of the muslims to speak against falsehood so what am i going to talk about today pravin togadia he is known for his speech the hatred speeches that he delivers against muslim community against the minorities of india instilling a sense of polarization and to try to say that he is going to work for hindutva and hindu rashtra in india he wants to bring the hindu rashtra in practice in india as the brother rightly said he said by 2015 gujarat would be declared as a hindu rashtra so what is the agenda why do they have to speak on these things what is that they are trying to achieve at the end of the day now if you have to see who is pravin togadia pravin togadia he is a doctor he is dr pravin togadia who has done his ms in oncology he is a cancer surgeon educated person he is not like a person who doesn't know much of this world he is a person who is educated and another interesting point when i came to learn about him that he is not a hindu amazing point isn't it a person who is not hindu he wants to establish hindu rashtra why is he really working for the hindu rashtra no who is he who is pravin togadia he is a jain he is a jain who belongs to the jain community and jains are not hindus in fact in 1996 the leaders of the jain community they approached the then prime minister of india deve gowda and said like we want the minority status and in 1997 they were also called for that so what i'm trying to say the jains are in reality they are not hindus in fact if you look into the past history you will come to know in the ancient times during the times of chandragupta maurya and the times of ashoka ashoka was a jain initially he was jain when he fought in the battle of kalinga during the times of kalinga he killed a lot of people and he was a jain at that point of time who did he fight against whom did chandragupta maurya fight against there was battle between jains and hindus and if you look into our times you may think you may wonder that you know the jains are hindu and the hindus are living in harmony no i have a report 
from the Times of India, which talks about the, the Jains and the Hindus conflict. It happened in 2006. It is also published in uh, India Today, May 1, with the heading as Conflict between Hindus and Jains over sacred sites on Mount Girnar, which is in Gujarat. They both are fighting for a place. The Hindus are saying this belongs to us. They say this belongs to Lord Dattatriya. And the Jains are saying this belongs to Neminath. So the conflict is between the Jains and the Hindus. They are not on one single platform. They both have great fights among themselves. Now what is he trying to establish at the end of the day? If he is a Jain and he doesn't want to consider him to be part of a Hindu, then what is this whole thing about? You must try to understand that there are many reports which say that the Jains are actually converting a lot of people to Jainism. You might wonder, how is it happening? Is it happening? We always find the Jains are in very less numbers. We say they are in very few percentage. But you know something? The conversion rate in Bihar, in North India, it is high. It is higher than the Muslims in certain places. They are working on an agenda. They want people to get into Jainism. So you would want to understand what is this all about? Why? What are they trying to achieve at the end of the day? See, in Meenakshi Puram, in 1981, the whole village in Tamil Nadu, it accepted Islam. Meenakshi Puram. It was later called as Rahmat Nagar. The whole people, the whole of the people of the village, they became Muslims. And immediately, the people who were ascribing themselves to the RSS, and the people from, you know, the people like Vajpayee and all these people who are uh, belonging to the BJP at that point of time, they all set their interest in Minakshipuram. They wanted to understand why people are converting in this large scale to Islam. So we have to do something. We have to control this. And how can they control? By increasing a sense of communal hatred amongst people. So the moment they come to know that Muslim is a nice man, Islam is a peaceful religion, they are nice people, it leads to salvation, then anybody would want to become Muslim. But they want to taint you with some image for which the person, even to come and talk to you, he would have second thoughts. Are ye to terrorist hai. You say, Dur rana padega. So this kind of feelings they want to bring into the minds and thereby they started promoting all these things. Now what do they want at the end of the day, if you see? They want to have the Muslims and the non-Muslims not to interact with each other. The recent you know, the elections, Pravin Togadia, he said that we would give the support to the Prime Minister who would ensure that they would include these many things in their election manifesto. What are those things? Article 370 should be abrogated. Common civil code must be brought, common civil code or uniform civil code. Then Ram Mandir has to be built according to Ram Janma Bhumi. And then stern law against terrorism. Terrorism, stern law against terrorism. I want to wonder, you know, how, how crazy it is. You know, this man in 2003, he was distributing Trishul for which he was caught by the police. And he is talking against terrorism. What kind of terrorism is he wants to, does he want to curb? 2003, he was the same man who was distributing Trishul in public, though the orders were given not to distribute the Trishuls. It is all open. The kind of talks that he gives, see in one of the talks he says, he talks about uh, Akbaruddin Oisi. He says, Ek kutta hai Hyderabad mein. Because Akbar Din Oyesi, he said, you just keep the police away for, for some times, then we will show you what we can do. But that was a general statement. We can't try to understand what he's trying to say at the end of the day. He's not making it very clear. But you hear to what Pravin Togadia had to say. He said, Hamne police ko Gujarat mein unko hata diya. He said, Hamne police ko Muzaffar Nagar mein hata diya. 
He's saying, we have done what you want to do. We killed a lot of Muslims. Why? We kept the police away. And he said, Ganga mein itna lash mila, usme yek bhi Hindu ka lash nahi hai. So these are the open challenge that he's giving, open statement. And still, Article 295A is not applicable on him. Instigating violence, instigating uh, other community, insulting other community, it is not applicable on him. But if you are giving a talk, if you are giving a talk, and you are talking about akhirat, and you happen to say, jo Allah ko na farman kia, or if you say, the person who associated partners with Allah, he enters Jahannam, just for this sake, you may be booked under 295A in India. It happened in, in uh, Mumbai. One of such brothers, who was actually doing dawah, he just happened to say, you know, if you don't worship Allah, and if you associate partners to him, you will go to hellfire. Just on this, he was booked under Article 295A. And this man openly is talking and he's challenging, he's making all these statements, and yet he's not been booked under 295A. Why? What's happening in India? See, many people in the past, they already have given up. Forget about Muslims. The non-Muslims have given up on the Indian democracy a long time ago. They said, democracy in India fell down, democracy in India collapsed the day the Babri Masjid collapsed. These are statements given by the non-Muslims. Arundhati Roy, she said, no hanging of Abzal Guru is the dark stain on Indian democracy. Who is saying all these things? Not Muslims. Non-Muslims have got to say that. So in today's time, if you say democracy is working, I don't see what is democracy at first place. We don't see what is happening. Now, Article 370, if you want to understand what is Article 370, Jammu and Kashmir are, they have been given certain privileges when it comes to, you know, ruling by their land. There are certain privileges because it has got historical relevance. The historical relevance is there because the majority were Muslims and they had a king. So at that point of time, when they wanted you know, they, them to collaborate with the Indian democratic system, there were certain concessions which were given to the Kashmiris and the Jammu Kashmir people. And now, what that includes, even if Indians, say for, apart from Jammu and Kashmir, they want to buy a land in Jammu and Kashmir, they cannot buy. Only the people of Jammu and Kashmir can buy the lands there. These are the certain concessions which have been given under Article 370. Now he wants this to be abrogated. He wants this to be abolished. And he says, any PM whoever has to come to power, you have to abolish this or you have to abrogate this. Now what is reasonable is that you have to talk to the people of Jammu and Kashmir. You can't just decide something from Bangalore and you decide for the people in Jammu and Kashmir. You have to find out what the people of Jammu and Kashmir want. If the Jammu and Kashmir people are accepting to something which you are saying, then that's good. But if they are not willing to accept what you want, then how are you going to establish it? You will not be able to establish. So first and foremost, you must bring these things in, an as in, a, way, in a way that you can have discussions. So just by saying we are going to abrogate or anything, it cannot work. Common civil court amongst the Muslims and non-Muslims. You know what is common civil code? See, we have the marriage law, the way we marry. We have the, the law of divorce, the law of inheritance. Muslims we have. And even the non-Muslims have, not just Muslims, even the Hindus have. Even the Hindus had the Hindu personal law. The Britishers in their times, they acknowledged that they cannot get into the religious sphere of the Muslims and the non-Muslims, that is Hindus. So they said, you can have your own personal law. The Hindus can have your own personal law. The Muslims can have your own personal law. That's what the... But what has happened over a period of time, the Hindu personal law is abolished. You know why it is abolished? Because a woman who is a widow, she cannot get married. And they found this cannot be practically possible. They cannot marry. And there is unlimited polygamy. You can marry anyone. Unlimited, unrestricted. No restriction at all. According to the Hindu personal law, there is no restriction for the number of wives. You can marry a woman whenever you want. Like if you know, even 
If you read the books of the Puranas and Mahabharata and all these things, you will find polygamy, polygyny, polyandry. You know, Draupadi, according to the mythology, she was married to five men, Pandavas, five men. Now, if they say, like, we're going to uh, do that because it is permissible in our Hindu Dharma, they found this is not going to be practically possible. Unrestricted marriages. Without marriages also you can live with many, according to the Hindu personal law. Krishna had 16,000 and several hundred wives or even consorts, you may say. I don't know. So the people, the thinking people among the Hindus, they said, no, we cannot tolerate this. Let us do away with this. And therefore, they abolished the Hindu marriage, uh, they abolished the Hindu personal law. But they cannot do that with Muslims. Why? Because Islam has got a real, you know, perfect code of living. You cannot do that. How to marry, how to divorce, everything is so perfect. If you're talking about marriage, you have to give the mahar. There has to be two witnesses. There has to be a wali. So perfect. And marriage can take place without much expense, with the least expense. But if you happen to see in other cultures, marriages will take for two nights continuously. And then they get married in the third day. So we in Islam, we don't have any of these nonsense. And then if you look into divorce also, it is so practical. The divorce methodology is so practical. A person, but you might have seen today's time, talak, talak, talak. You know, talak, 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 and she separate and he separate. That is not the real talak, you know. But according to Islam, you see, which has been legislated in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 231 and 232, 233. What it says, if anybody wants to give a divorce, then if he pronounces talaq, then he has to count the number of days. For how many days? For three menstrual cycles period. So you have to wait. And in between, if they want to reconcile, yes, the talaq is void. So again, the, the talaq is not at all considered. But in case he gives talaq, that is considered as one talaq. Then again, if they want to marry, they can marry. So until three talaqs, they can always, if they want to have a change of mind, they can get married. So these are all perfect laws. You cannot change this. And if you want us to follow the common personal law, which man-made law, man-made laws, we cannot follow that. We feel that the man-made laws are so very inferior in comparison to what Allah has legislated. Come for a debate. If you want to come for a debate, we will disprove, inshallah, your man-made laws saying that, you know, the way of conducting marriages and all these things, whatever you have, you know, today you are considering according to the man-made laws, live-in relationships are considered okay. Tomorrow you will say, live-in live -in relationship is considered okay, the Muslim has to get into the live-in relationship. We would say it's not possible. We cannot get into the live-in relationship at all. Tomorrow you will acknowledge that homosexuality is way of life, but Muslims cannot acknowledge that. So we cannot come into this garbage. We cannot get into this shit. Sorry to use those words. <laughs> it's coming on spontaneously. Because I cannot say anything for that. Because you talk about homosexuality, about 50 years ago, it was considered to be something which is a horrible act, Article 377. And today you are considering it to be something, it's a way of life, and you want us to follow that? Impossible, it's impossible. We cannot follow that nonsense. We cannot get into that nonsense. If you want to come into a debate, please come. We will prove to you why homosexuality is bad, why living relationship is bad, why our way of life is the best. So inshallah, this system of um, you know, common civil code, it is also not going to happen. But you know what? They want to just pick on these topics just to keep you instigated, that's all. Nothing else. They know it is not going to be achievable. They know none of these things are going to be achievable, but they want to keep you polarized. They want you to feel the insecurity in you, fear in you, even to do dawa to them. You will not have the strength to do dawa. Now let us talk about the last one. I'll just finish my talk very quickly. Ramajanma Bhumi. You know, Ramajanma Bhumi is all about Ram was born in Ayodhya, and we want to build it. And the allegation is that Babur, he demolished the temple and he built the mosque. That is the allegation. Now I want to find out from the historical books, from the times of Babur, that is 1526, until the 18th century, let them bring one proof to say that 
Babur demolished a temple and then he built the masjid. Let them bring one proof. They cannot bring even one proof. Because there is no proof at all. Babur did not demolish any temple. There is no records for that. And if you happen to see, if you happen to see, Babur is giving an advice to his son Humayun in Babur Nama. He's saying, my dear son, you are ruling a people who are Hindus. Majority of them are Hindus. They don't eat beef, so you stay away from slaughtering even the cows. You know, that is the kind of sentiment that he had. Whether he was right or wrong is different. But he was a person who was having a real sentiment, feeling for the non-Muslims. He didn't want to hurt their feelings. And we all know the glorious time of the Indian Empire. They say that the Mughal Empire, Akbar's Empire. Akbar's empire is supposed to be the glorious times of the Indian uh, you know, history. Glorious time. And who is Akbar? Grandson of Babur, actually. He is the grandson of Babur. Akbar had a relationship with Birbal, Todarmal, and all these people. And the people in those times, they were loving Akbar so much. The non-Muslims were loving Akbar so much. Had they really wanted you know, their temple back, Akbar would have said, you can take it back. Because he's already giving a lot of money for the non-Muslims. Akbar is actually giving a lot of money in those times, even to build temples. You'll be astonished. Even Tipu Sultan, he used to help a lot of non-Muslims to build temples. Whether it is right or wrong, that's a debatable issue. If I am a person who's asked for you know, building a temple or idol, we will say it is haram, I would not. But I'm just telling you, citing you some reference, saying that the kings of the times, they were doing this. So it would have been very easy for people in the time of Akbar to just say, give our land back. He would have given it back. The glorious time. But why they wanted this, why they wanted to rake up this issue? They wanted the communal disharmony in India. So all of these things, we can talk so many things. There is one article which has come in uh, Indian Express, November 8, 2011 wherein Togadia says, behead those who convert Hindus. Behead those who convert Hindus. People amongst uh, the Jains are the ones who are converting people to Jainism. But you don't come to know that. You don't come to know that. They are the people who are doing that in a major way. Muslims are not doing much. Muslims are really not doing much. You see, Muslims are very busy with their own life. How busy they are, we know. There are so many groups among the Muslims Probably there's a very small group which is actually doing dawah. The majority is not interested in all that. In fact, the majority does not pray also. Five times Salah, the majority is not praying. The Muslims are not doing. Allah is giving hidayah. Allah is guiding people to whomever He wants. So, what I have to say is that let us not be carried away by people like Praveen Togadi. Why we are organizing this event is that don't have an element of fear in you for somebody like Praveen Togadia or any of these people, Ashok Singhal or all these people. They don't have big masses for them. He's saying, I'm the spokesperson for 100 crore Hindus. First of all, he is not a Hindu himself. He's not a Hindu himself. He's not a spokesperson for 100 crore Hindus. He's not the spokesperson for Karunanidhi and Jailalitha. No way. They don't accept what he's saying. You know, Karunanidhi is asking a question when he was talking about Ram Janmabhumi, he said, Karunanidhi, he said, see, Raja Raja Cholan, he lived about, say, about 10 centuries ago. Till date, we don't know where he was born. But I wonder how you people are able to identify exactly where Ram was born, whom, according to your reference, he was born lakhs of years ago. So how did you identify exactly in this place? Whose question is this? Karunanidhi. Karunanidhi does not accept. You cannot penetrate into Tamil Nadu at all. Because the seed that is sowed by, you know, Periyar, Evi Ramaswamy Periyar, these people, Hindutva people, cannot do anything there. They cannot do anything. They cannot penetrate. They cannot penetrate into Kerala also. They can't get the entire Kerala population to say that we are with you, Togadia. No way. So he is not a spokesperson for the entire non-Muslim population of India. First and foremost, we have to understand that. Even the Jain population does not acknowledge him to be a single leader whom they have to adhere upon. Even the Jain population. So come out of that blockness. Come out of that blockness. 
whatever he is, his agenda, first, of, first and foremost, he doesn't want to achieve that. He has got no interest in achieving it. Person who is not a Hindu, why would he be interested in building a Ram Mandir? He doesn't worship. You know what is Jainism? Jainism does not believe in God also. The reality is that Jainism does not believe in God. Now when, um, you know, uh, when uh, Richard Dawkins, he was interviewed by Terence McNally, who happens to be a playwright, uh, writer. So um, he was questioned, you know, Richard Dawkins, he's an atheist. For all of you who is following him, you know very well that he's an atheist. He, he don't like people following religion. But he is appreciating Jainism. He's saying, Jainism, if anything is like Jainism, we have no problem with that. Because it just talks about philosophy, we have no problem with that. <laughs> so I was wondering why is he so much appreciating Jainism? You know, Jainism is such a religion, doesn't want to kill anyone, according to we, what we are taught. No, it doesn't want to even kill the pest, pest in the rodents. In that way, you should not even kill the spider in your home. You're not supposed to even boil the water. You're not supposed to kill the germs, according to them. And therefore, you know, they cover even their mouth. They don't want the germs to enter and die. So this is what Jainism, according to what we are taught. But you have to understand Kalinga, Chandragupta Maurya, then uh, Amoga Varsha, and all these things. You know, if you see, look into the history, Jainism permitted people to fight in battles. Jainism permitted. But the way that they are programming us is to say that, you know, there's no harm with Jainism and all that stuff. So I would like to end my talk. Just wanted to give a, just a few thoughts that I want to share. We Muslims, we don't have to fear any non-Muslim leader. You understand? They cannot do anything. They cannot do anything to you unless and until Allah wills. Nothing can happen to you unless and until Allah wills. Go openly, do what you have to do. Be what you have to be. Nobody is going to do anything to you. If we are together as a powerful unit, united force, inshallah, inshallah, we can dictate terms, inshallah. Allah. We are about 20 crore people in the world, in, in India. You know, we are about 20 crore people. In, well, the moment you said Takbir, I was a little shy. <laughs> so my thought of, you know, my thoughts also vanished a little bit. <laughs> Barakalafi. Sorry. I know, I know, I know the uncle. So 20 crore Muslim population in India, the second most population in the world. If we are united, inshallah, can you imagine what can happen? We are just not coming out of the blockness in our minds. We have to come out of it. And their agenda is to stop us from being that liberated, being that your own self. You know, they don't want you to be your own self. The moment you are on your own self, then they will have, uh, you know, they will have to fall down. So that's the reason they want to keep you always, you know, in the feeling that you are having the fear, the sense of insecurity in you. And once they achieve that, then they are successful. So I want all of you to come out of it, inshallah. Let's all work together, inshallah, without any banner. There's no issue. Today, the name is Mission Possible. If you want to change it to anything and you want to carry it on a different name, we are with you, inshallah. Barakallah,